Okay, so I think that we'll get started now. I'm just going to turn on my video to appropriately welcome all of you. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Gabby Escudero, and I am the Deputy Director for the Data for Impact Project. I warmly welcome and thank all of you for your partici participation in today's webinar on family planning needs across the life cycle in Bangladesh, a synthesis of recent evidence. So now I'm going to turn off my video. But before we get started with the webinar, please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, and thank you for those who have already done so. Please also use the Q&A feature for questions at any time during the presentation, and the speakers will address them after they speak. This session is being recorded, and we will share the link to the webinar recording and the slides after the webinar. Throughout the presentation, we will also be adding links to the sources that are cited in the chat, and the full list of resources can be found at the end of the presentation and on the D4I website. With that, I will pass it over to Dr. Sean Curtis, Faculty Principal Investigator of the Data for Impact Project and Professor in the Department of Maternal and Child Health at the Gilling School of Global Public Health, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Over to you, Sean, to introduce the team. Thank you. Okay, great. Hi everyone, I will also turn my video on just briefly and then, while I do the introductions and then I will turn it off. Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for attending this webinar on family planning needs across the life cycle in Bangladesh. So as Gabby said, I am Sean Curtis and I am presenting today with my colleague Moinadin Haider from ICDDRB in Bangladesh. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, two other co-authors for this presentation, Dr. Mizanur Rahman, who conceptualized much of the analysis that we will be presenting today, and Mraha Bubur Rahman, who along with Moin conducted the statistical analysis, and I believe both of them are online today. All right, I will turn my video off now. Okay. Um, okay. So. Whoops. Okay, so um, before getting into the specifics of this webinar, I want to provide a brief overview of the work of Data for Impact for those of you who are not familiar with the project. So D4I strengthens capacity to generate and use new high quality health and related development sector data, to use routine and other existing data, investigate program effectiveness, support adaptive management and learn from evidence. Our work includes generating evidence, strengthening capacity, ensuring data quality, integrating gender, promoting data use, and sharing learning about all these processes from our experiences. So this webinar will bring together the results of several recent secondary analyses of survey data on contraceptive use conducted by the D4I team in Bangladesh. We will also link the results to recommendations for reproductive health policy and programs in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is currently developing its new health population and nutrition sector-wide plan, and we are working to use these results to inform that process. As such, this work touches on several of these D4I streams of work, including generating evidence, strengthening capacity, integrating gender, and promoting data use. Okay. So I'm going to start with some background on recent trends in fertility and contraceptive use in Bangladesh. So the total fertility rate or TFR in Bangladesh declined from 3.4 in 1993 when the first DHS was conducted to 2.3 in 2011 and has remained at around 2.3 since then. The mean ideal family size declined from 2.5 to a low of 2.2 over this period. In 2017, the mean ideal family size and the TFR were both of around 2.3. Over the same period, the percentage of married women using any method of contraception increased from 45% in 1993 to around 62% in 2017. The CPR has stalled at around 61 to 62% since 2011, mirroring the stall in the TFR. These findings suggest that the fertility decline in Bangladesh from 1993 to 2011 was associated with increased contraceptive use, 
in order to bring observed fertility in line with desired fertility. And that since then, contraceptive use and fertility have remained constant and in line with desired fertility. These population level indicators mask individual experiences of unintended pregnancy, however. In 2017, one in five births was reported as unintended, and there were an estimated 35 abortions annually per thousand women of reproductive age in 2015 to 2019. This new demographic context of relatively low fertility that aligns with fertility preferences, relatively high contraceptive use, but individual experiences of unintended pregnancy requires a person-centered approach to analyzing family planning behavior in Bangladesh. So one way of looking at family planning behavior is to examine family planning across the reproductive life cycle. So here we see an illustration of the reproductive life cycle. Different points in the life cycle are associated with different family planning and reproductive health needs. Specifically, we can divide the reproductive life cycle into the period before marriage, from marriage to first birth, the period after the first birth and subsequent births until the last desired birth, and then the period after the last birth until the end of the reproductive ages. Each of these periods provides different opportunities to reach couples with counseling and services tailored to meet their needs at that time. So now let's look at recent evidence on fertility and contraceptive behavior in each of these life cycle stages. We will start with the period before marriage. Sexual behavior before marriage is highly frowned upon in Bangladesh, so data on premarital sexual experience are limited. However, we have data on unmarried adolescents' knowledge of family planning methods from the 2019-2020 Adolescent Health and Wellbeing Survey. This slide shows that 72% of unmarried girls aged 15 to 19 have heard of pills, compared to 61% of unmarried adolescent boys. Boys are more likely than girls to have heard of condoms, however. Relatively few unmarried adolescents have heard of emergency contraceptive pills, with boys more likely to report having heard of them than girls. So, while many adolescents have heard of family planning methods, there are substantial gaps in knowledge of a full range of methods. A majority of unmarried girls and boys would like more information on family planning. Preferred sources vary across individuals and by a and by sex. The internet is the preferred source of such information for adolescent boys, while girls report a variety of preferred sources, including books and health providers. Only around 6 to 7% of adolescent boys and girls report teachers as their preferred source of information on family planning. The government of Bangladesh does not currently provide any family planning information to unmarried adolescents in its reproductive health program. So based on this analysis, we recommend that reproductive health programming should incorporate a provision of tailored information on family planning to unmarried adolescent girls and boys using a variety of information channels. There is demand for this information, but it should not only be provided through schools. So we will now turn to the period from marriage to first birth. So both the median age at marriage and the median age at first birth have been increasing in Bangladesh. In 2017, the median age at marriage for women was 17.5 years, but that is still below the legal age of marriage of 18 years. Although the median age at first birth has increased from 18.3 in 1993 to 19.5 in 2017, the interval between marriage and first birth has decreased from three to two years. So while women are waiting longer to get married, they are starting childbearing more quickly once they are married. So this analysis examines contraceptive behavior in the first birth interval using life table analysis of DHS contraceptive calendar data. 
The percentage of women who initiated contraceptive use within the first 12 months of marriage increased from 28% in 1993 to 50% in 2017. About a third of women conceived within 12 months of marriage before initiating contraceptive use. This has not changed much over time, which may in part be related to low knowledge of family planning methods among some unmarried women and men, as seen in earlier slides. Fertility preferences also play a role in decisions to use contraception after marriage. The percentage of first births in the three years before each survey that were reported to be unintended has declined from a high of 20% in 1999 to around 10% in 2017 as contraceptive use has increased in the first birth interval. So the following recommendations follow from this analysis. First, provide a full range of spacing methods to newly married couples who want to delay their first birth. Second, provide counseling and behavior change communication on the benefits of waiting to have a first birth, for example, until after age 20. And third, provide economic opportunities for young married women to provide alternatives to early childbearing. Economic opportunities for young and married women may also encourage further delays in the age of marriage to after age 18. So now I will hand over to Moin. Thank you, Sean. Now we discuss the next cycle. Marriage initiates the most important phase of reproductive life cycle. Life changes further after the first birth. A couple goal is achieved. The desire of being a mother is fulfilled. After the first or any other higher order birth, the woman may want more children or may not want any more children. The World Health Organization recommends waiting for at least two years after childbirth before trying to conceive again. Else, the birth is considered shortest best. And a shortest best birth increases the risk of adverse maternal and perinatal outcomes. Still, every fourth of the second and higher order birth is shortest best in low and middle income countries. Next. Here, uh, we see the situation of shortest space births in Bangladesh. According to Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey 1993, 54% of the second or higher order births were shortest space. Although dropped substantially after that, it is still high at 25% in 2017. In recent years, one in five of the shortest births occur within 18 months after previous birth. Other one in five occur between 18 to 23 months, and the remaining three in five occur in the third year. Uh, this, this situation can be improved through adopting a family planning method immediately after birth and Continuing a method can continuing a method afterwards can help reduce the burden of short space birth. Next. In this slide, we see the cumulative probability of initiating contraceptive use over the first 12 months postpartum from 1993 to 2017. Adoption of postpartum family planning has been increasing over time. In 2017, the probability of adopting a contraceptive method within first 12 months postpartum was 74%, which climbed from 32% in 1993. Adoption of a family planning is most common in the first four months postpartum, but continues to increase gradually over the entire postpartum period. Next. Increased use of postpartum family planning is important, and so is the use of modern and effective methods. In this slide, we focus only on the 2017 DHS data to explore how use of specific methods varies over the first 12 months postpartum. Here, we are using a Marquis Life Table 
So rather than focusing only on the first method adopted, we look at the method used in each month postpartum. This allows for any method discontinuation or uh, switching over the postpartum period. The result shows that although a few women adopt long-acting reversible contraceptives or permanent methods, when they do so, they do so soon after birth. Use of pills increases rapidly to about four months, then continues to increase more slowly after that. And a few women also become pregnant in the first year. Uh, this tiny portion is not visible in this graph. This is on the top. Uh, a greenish line you may see over on the top of the graph. Uh, next. The risk of early conception following a birth is influenced by whether or not a woman initiate, initiates contraceptive use and whether or not she has resumed menstruating. Here we examine trends in the median duration of postpartum amenorrhea and the median time until postpartum contraceptive use from 1993 to 2017. The median time to first contraceptive use following a birth has been declining over time. The median duration of amenorrhea has also been declining. This means that postpartum contraceptive use is substituting for postpartum amenorrhea to some degree. However, uh, the median time until contraceptive use is longer than the median duration of amenorrhea. Although the gap declined over this period, it is still two months. This two months is a potentially risky period for early pregnancy. So understanding the relationship between postpartum family planning use and resumption of menstruation is also important. Next. This slide shows the probability of either initiating family planning or receiving menstruation by 12 months postpartum and by which came first. The majority of women resume menstruating before they adopt a contraceptive method. And this probability has increased to 61% by 2017. It reflects earlier resumption of menstruation over time. This means that the proportion of women potentially exposed to the risk of pregnancy for at least one month in the 12 months postpartum it has been increasing over time despite increased postpartum family planning use. The probability of initiating family planning before or in the same month of menstruation resumption is relatively low but has been increasing particularly since 2011. Next. Here in this slide, we focus on the 2017 BDHS data again to explore how amenorrhea and contraceptive use jointly evolve over the first 12 months postpartum. This analysis uses a multi state life table, so it incorporates any method discontinuation. The chart clearly shows the substitution of contraceptive use for postpartum amenorrhea over the first 12 months following a birth. The green part of the graph represents amenorrhea with no contraceptive use. Uh, it declines over the first 12 months. The blue part of the chart represents family planning use when menstruation has returned. It increases over the period. The red part at the chart at the top shows the probability of not using a family planning method and not being amenorrheic. This is the status that is potentially exposed to the risk of an early pregnancy. The probability of this status declines over the first four months postpartum and levels off at around 20% after that. To reduce further from this 20%, improved knowledge through postpartum family planning counseling may be an effective intervention. Next. Having contact with medical personnel is necessary for postpartum family planning counseling. Women's contact with medically trained provider during antenatal care and delivery services creates this opportunity. As 
more than 80% women receive at least one antenatal care from a medically trained provider, and half of the women deliver at health facilities. Bangladesh can utilize these opportunities to provide postpartum family planning, counseling, and services. Next. However, we have to remember to capitalize the antenatal care services by medically trained providers and deliveries in health facilities, the program must consider the private sector as majority of the women seek antenatal care and delivery services from the private health facilities. Next. Postnatal care. This is another service point where women can be counseled and also offered family planning. Although half of the women receive postnatal care within two days of delivery, a few of them receive information on family planning. Thus, this service point remains underutilized to counsel and offer postpartum family planning. Receiving family planning information during antenatal care is even lower. Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey 2017-18 did not collect data on receiving family planning information during delivery, but from other sources, we know that receiving family planning information and being offered a family planning method during delivery is also low. Next. Based on this analysis and on a situation analysis of postpartum family planning in Bangladesh, that data for impact published in 2019, uh, we have several recommendations for this life cycle stage. Uh, for example, one barrier to implementing postpartum family planning is that the government in government sector, maternal health services are provided by Directorate General of Health Services. But family planning services are provided by Directorate General of Family Planning. There are policies for strengthening coordination between the two directorates uh, so that uh, family planning services can be provided. Uh, but that services include counseling and also service uh, that can be provided during antenatal care, delivery care, and postnatal care. However, evidence of weak services suggests that we need further actions. Next. Uh, now I hand back to Sean. Thank you, Moin. So we will now review evidence related to the final life cycle stage, the period after the last desired birth. So DHS data show that in 2017, 60% of married women did not want any more children. Among women with two living children, 79% do not want any more children. The median age at second birth is 23.9 in Bangladesh. So couples will need to effectively use contraception for over 20 years on average to avoid unwanted births. Despite this high need for uh, long-term effective contraception to limit births, use of long-acting reversible and permanent contraceptive methods is low in Bangladesh. Only 9% of married women were using these methods in 2017, up slightly from a low of 7.3% in 2007. We have seen previously that postpartum uptake of long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods is low, but that most postpartum adoption of these methods occurs immediately after delivery. We also want to note here that LARC or long-acting reversible contraceptives can be used for spacing as well as limiting. Facility readiness to provide long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods is low in Bangladesh. Among public facilities that are designated to provide these methods, only around 62 to 63% provide permanent methods, and only 69% provide IUDs. Implants are offered by 78% of public facilities designated to provide them. Even when a facility offers these methods, only a third or fewer have all required staff, equipment, and supplies available to offer the method.
So low facility readiness is likely to be a contributing factor in the low use of long acting reversible and permanent methods in Bangladesh, as are high provider vacancy levels, which also contribute to low readiness. Facilities that provide delivery services often do not provide tubal ligation and IUDs for immediate postpartum use, and there is low knowledge of postpartum IUDs and tubal ligation among women. Short-acting methods such as pills are readily available through pharmacies, and there is generally low interest in long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods among women. So some recommendations that follow from this analysis and related D4I publications are shown here. There is some overlap with the recommendations for the previous life cycle stage because long acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods are often initiated immediately postpartum and long acting reversible contraceptives can also be used for spacing. The recommendations focus on strengthening the supply environment to offer the full range of contraceptive options to couples, including long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods, and increasing awareness of these methods. We focus here on long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods because they offer several advantages for long-term use, and there are multiple supply-side constraints that potentially limit knowledge and use of these methods. However, we want to emphasize that method choice is up to the woman and her, woman and her partner, and the focus on long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods here is in the context of ensuring full informed choice for long-term method use. In this final section, we will share evidence from a study to test a segmented client approach to family planning counseling as one example of a life cycle approach. This study that I'm going to talk about was implemented in collaboration with the USA Bangladesh Research for Decision Makers project implemented by ICDDRB. So the segmented client approach is a tested approach to provide comprehensive counseling tailored to women's life cycle stage and contraceptive use experience. It defines segments based on fertility preferences and contraceptive use history and uses the ideas of progressing through different methods as confidence with contraceptive use builds and family planning needs evolve while maintaining emphasis on full informed choice from all methods. The, me the approach aims to ensure women have full information on methods and their advantages and disadvantages based on life cycle stage. So this slide shows an example of client segmentation from the study that was implemented in rural Bangladesh. Three different segments are defined here. Women who do not want to have any more children and are currently using short acting methods. Women who want to space their pregnancies and are currently using short acting method. And women who do not want any more children or who want to space their pregnancies, but who are not currently using any method. Counseling is tailored to each segment and highlights methods that represent a progression in terms of effectiveness while maintaining full information and choice. So, for example, for segment B, women who want to space their pregnancy for more than two years and are currently using short acting method, and a sort of medical progression would be an IUD or an implant or long acting reversible contraceptive method. So this slide shows uptake of contraceptive methods by women in the area in which the segmented client counseling approach was implemented compared to women in comparison areas where the segmented counseling approach was not implemented. The chart shows the percentage of clients who chose implants or IUDs as an example. At baseline, which is the green bar, levels of IUD and implant use were fairly similar in each area uh, within each preference group. After the intervention, uh, use of IUDs and implants was significantly higher among both spaces and limiters in the intervention area. Most of the increased use was of implants. Overall contraceptive use was similar in the two areas, but short acting method use was higher in the comparison area. So the segmented counseling affected method choice rather than overall use of contraception. Okay, so to wrap up, fertility decline has stalled since 2011 in Bangladesh at just above replacement level. The new demographic context and shifts in health service use and sources of care require a fresh perspective on reproductive health programming. 
We have presented several analyses of fertility and contraceptive behavior across the life cycle in Bangladesh. The life cycle perspective is a woman-centered approach that highlights different family planning and reproductive health needs at each stage of the life cycle. The evidence presented will inform efforts to utilize the large and vibrant public and private health sectors in Bangladesh to provide strengthened family planning services efficiently and with high quality. So to summarize, there is a need for increased family planning education for adolescents before marriage. There is demand for such information, but to date, family planning education for unmarried young people has not been included in government reproductive health programming. Contraceptive use is well established at each life cycle stage, but there is need for further behavior change communication and counseling tailored to each life cycle stage to address continued early childbearing, gaps between the end of postpartum amenorrhea and initiation of contraceptive use, and low knowledge of and demand for long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods. We also recommend strengthening postpartum family planning services, including in the private sector, along with strengthening provision of long-acting reversible contraceptives and permanent methods in both public and private sectors to address supply side gaps in family planning services that limit couples' options. And here we have a list of the various resources on which the presentation is based. This is the first slide with four of them. And I believe Gabby's been putting those in the chat that we've been going along. And here's a, some more. So these will all be available in this slide and are all available on the website. And with that, I think uh, we, uh, that wraps up the presentation part and we can now open up for questions. So please put your Q&A, your questions in the Q&A box, I see that we have a few there. I will stop screen sharing so that I can look at the Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a few questions here. Um, and so I'm gonna start with the ones in the Q&A and I'll also check the chats if there's any questions in there as well. Um, so, um, we have a few questions um, about economic opportunities um, for unmarried, op um, from unmarried and unmarried women. Um, so I, I think um, I will answer that one. Okay, and I can maybe ask, I think we have others on the team are also available, but I think it's just generally thinking about one of the things that has been shown in other countries with um, where there's been declines in fertility to below replacement uh, fertility that competition between childbearing and other economic and educational goals are one way for um, that tends to bring fertility down even further and delay childbearing so things like further educational opportunities and just and generally more economic opportunities for women um, in different pro um, professional areas are um, just generally increased female labor force participation does tend to have effects on fertility. But I'm going to open up and just ask if any of my colleagues in Bangladesh, if Moin or Mizan would like to add anything on that. Uh, Sean, uh, I'm not adding anything. I think uh, you have explained it. OK, great. All right. Um, and then the next question is, um, what are the drivers behind the decrease in Bangladesh's fertility rate? Um, I think we, we've got a more thorough analysis that is available in, the, in a brief, um, a technical brief that is now available on the D4I website. Um, I mean, the main the, the increases in contraceptive use um, were, have driven most of the fertility decline between in the 1993 to 2011 and you could and what you could see in one of the slides maybe i um maybe i will just share my screen again just for a moment and pull up this slide um oops sorry didn't do quite as I expected it to do. So if you can see on this slide that the fertility rate came down in line with desired fertility rate. So we see this um, 
contraceptive use was increasing, as you can see on the next slide, and that brought fertility down in, li in line with fertility preferences. So a lot of that was driven by um, increased um, contraceptive use. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. And, and Misan, would you like to add anything on this? Yeah, I think the uh, definitely the family planning program in Bangladesh is, has been a very uh, <clears throat> very successful program in reducing TFR total fertility rate. This is the programmatic approach. The the socioeconomic development, like women's education, reduction in child mortality. Those things has 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 led to the you know overall family planning. Uh, 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 achievement uh, more uh, efficient. So education, reduction in child mortality, increase in contraceptive use, those things are the, I think, driving factors related to fertility decline. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, so do you want me to answer some of the other questions? Uh, uh, yeah, we can, um, we can. Um, yeah, go ahead. Then I'll... Next question. Um, so the next question um, from Satara Rama, why long acting reversible contraceptives recommended at the last birth? Um, Larks and PIMS can also be recommended after the first birth. Um, Misan, do you want to answer that? First? Yeah, I think definitely the alert is very appropriate for uh, the, after the first birth because there are, we, we still have mistimed um, birth happening in the, uh, in Bangladesh. So LERC is uh, IUD and, uh, and I mean, uh, implants are recommended and they are given. Uh, and we, we showed it for the, the last birth, meaning that these are the methods available at the facilities that during delivery, but the program has not yet <clears throat> shown any definitive progress in uh, PPFP. So I think um, uh, we need, <laughs> the program needs more work, more, more uh, better planning, better implementation. Yep, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mizan. Um, but yeah, um, okay, uh, so let's go to the next question. What about provider bias during counseling services? If a woman has a daughter, so practitioners don't recommend family planning methods. We have seen this in our context in Pakistan, any evidence in Bangladesh? Um, I think, um, again, I don't know if Mizan or Moin, would it, one of you like to, to take that? Yeah, I think, uh... The you know the currently the TFR is two point three and it's, you know and there is that there are a indication that there is some uh, preference for uh, greater preference for sons over daughters, but the fertility fertility is in that level that the effect of that is not visible in 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 general, but definitely there are some preference in Bangladesh. Yeah, and we did look, just to add on that, we did look a little bit at um, sex preferences for children as a driver for fertility being above, um, exceeding desired fertility. And we did see some evidence that um, couples with two, um, two daughters were more likely to go on to have a third child um, than those with one son and one daughter. And also if they had two sons, they were slightly more likely to go on to have another child. I think that the whether it's provider driven though or um, couples driven, and we can't really disentangle that with the analysis we did, but we do see pretty high levels of, of contraceptive use even, even um, for couples with two, um, with two daughters. Uh, and a lot of the contraceptive use is pill, pills in pharmacies. So, there's a lot of autonomy to be able to go and get those methods um, get themselves without going to a provider if they want to. Yeah, uh, Sean, um, I am adding one information. Uh, okay, please go ahead, Moin. The uh, uh, question was, if there is any provider bias during counseling services, you yes, uh, um, we did another analysis. If, if the providers are uh, 
providing postpartum family planning counseling during antenatal care or postnatal care visits and uh, what are the potential determinants we find that um, the there is provider bias providers are providing the counseling particularly uh, to those women who had uh, three or more children uh, including the last birth and counseling during pnc then the parity three or higher order birth women are uh, only are, are the lone determinant uh, and there is uh, no significant relationship with uh, the wealth wealth status of the woman uh, but there is relationship with uh, women's education and if she is living in the urban area so uh, we we find some provider bias still the uh, level of counseling is very low uh, providing postpartum family planning counseling during anc is around 12% and uh, around 22% of the women who receive at least one postnatal care uh, among them 22% um, receive uh, counseling I think if I recall correctly, I'm, I'm Moin as well. There was one analysis done that suggested that IUDs people were providers were hesitant to um, talk about IUDs a lot because of lack of confidence in providing the method. Am I remembering that correctly? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. So uh, we have a few questions here from Dr. Hassan. Um, so did we find any, did we, did we have any findings of an association with economic status and uh, contraception? Any findings on willingness to accept or reject con, uh, contraception if, if woman had the decision-making power that her husband will use contraception method instead of her or not? Is the emergency contraceptive pill under the list of government medicine list? It can be one of the barriers of availability to prevent unwanted pregnancy. And at 51% of home delivery, is there any mechanism for, um, for um, providing contraception for home deliveries, any recommendations on that? There's quite a lot in there. So let's start with the first one. Any findings on association of economic status and use of contraception? Did any of my colleagues like to comment on that one? <clears throat> yeah, I think um, this, uh, there are some, re the interaction between economic status and regionality of the, uh, in Bangladesh. Like women in the eastern region, uh, the poorer have higher fertility than the richer people. But in the western part of the country, uh, the differential is not, uh, uh, there are not much differences between rich and poor. So that, that is definitely through the use of contraception, differential use of contraception by socioeconomic status. The Thanks. next question. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Sean, Sean, you yeah, do you want to go ahead? Do you want to go ahead? Okay, I think uh, definitely we know that the the whether the man would be volunteering to adopt a method instead of his wife. We don't see that in in Bangladesh. <laughs> we don't see in many countries, in in many developing countries. Um, so I think uh, it's, the, it's the burden uh, of the women. For example, we don't have uh, NSV much. We have some use of condoms, but it's very low, but and condom doesn't it have low effectiveness. The most of the methods used in Bangladesh is pill followed by injectables, and then uh, only few are LRCPM, and th those are also for women. And NSB use is less than, I think, less than 1%, I think 0.6%. So it's, it's, it's the women who uh, bear the burden of fam family planning. Okay. Uh, emergency pills, I think, are available at the government and also uh, other private uh, drug, drug stores and other, other places. Uh, it, and there is one question. It can be one of the barriers of unavailability to prevent unwanted pregnancy many times. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think emergency pill are available. Uh, the one, the last, last comment I think is as five to one 
percent at home delivery is there any mechanism is oil functioning for them on contraceptive method no contraceptive methods are available uh, in the facilities when during delivery but those deliveries take take place at home i think they the women then go to some facilities or they they buy pills or condoms from drug stores so it's a combination of government ngo and private sector facilities uh, uh, and then for home i think we have family welfare assistants visiting home they deliver pills and condoms yeah. okay yeah and i think the comments that, that moin made around uh, antenatal care and postnatal care as contact points even for women who have home deliveries um some of them will also be having i uh, will have anc and postnatal care so those are all up Opportunities. Well, antenatal care is an opportunity for counseling. A postnatal care is another opportunity um, for a provision of methods, as as Mizan was alluding to there. Anything to add, Moin, on any of that? Uh, regarding the um, home delivery, getting contraceptive method during uh, home delivery or deliveries in home, uh, we haven't seen that in data, but from uh, several field visits, we find that. Uh, sometimes family welfare assistants um, they uh, provide uh, upon pills which is a uh, contraceptive pill uh, before delivery and, and when the woman is in her third trimester and um, then fws visit her and provide the uh, pill so that uh, she can start it immediately after birth great thanks very much Okay, so the next um, oops, uh, is, um, do you only use DHS data or other sources? And you mentioned the comparison area and intervention area. Much of the analysis that we presented is DHS, but it's not only DHS data. We put the source on each slide to be able to see that um, more clear, closely when you get the slide deck. Um, the particular intervention comparison area slide was from a study uh, that was done in collaboration with the research for decision makers project that is uh, that was a um an actual comparison an, 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 um, implementation science research study so that was not dhs data uh, we also use data from the adolescent health and welfare well-being survey and uh, from the health facility survey were also included in some of the slides as well um, anything else to add to that moin Right. Um, okay, um, the next um, is this study considered the impact of long acting or using the family planning for the life course on women's health and social harmony, or is there any study conducted about that? Um, with this particular study, we haven't taken it to looking at outcomes of family planning. Um, again, Mizan or um, Moin, do you wanna add anything there? I think the um, intervention point for PPFP uptake, uh, I think the ANC is the best time, I believe, <laughs> because you can pr prepare an omen when she she comes to the, uh, for ANC visit. Uh, it, during the first trimester, you can give her some information regarding her next delivery that the, the, the the next delivery if she wants to have another child it it it, it would be better to have a child after three years of her for this birth so just give some information and and if the, the if a child is is born before three years of interval they have a, both the mother and the child has high risk of morbidity and mortality and so on and so forth and then in the, in the second and third trimester, they can provide, the, the ANC providers can provide information on various methods and advantages and disadvantages of method. And they can also help them in preparing to make a decision to adopt a method at, during delivery if that delivery takes place at a facility. So in that sense, I think the, you have an, an opportunity to prepare the woman 
to adopt a method right at the, um, the delivery and it's kind of you know one stop shopping and then the, those methods are uh, lr cpm and effective more effective cost uh, more effective and then uh, you know that can help really in bangladesh in uh, the, the current conservative prevalence rate is 62 percent it's very unlikely that it, <laughs> in last 10 years it's not increasing but if the use of LR CPM can be increased, given that level of CPR, TFR can be further reduced. So I think PPFP um, uh, provision, the counseling and method provision should be should be enhanced in, in, in Bangladesh. Okay. Thanks, Nizam. And I think um, just on terms of other studies, there are a number of other studies that have shown the benefits of birth spacing um, on um, on child health outcomes, particularly also on some maternal health outcomes. So there is there is evidence in other ways um, that look at that. Although I think it's, it can sometimes be a little bit hard to disentangle um, some of those effects. And there was another study that looked at some of the long term effects of family planning programs. As, um, and so there are there is other literature on that. Okay, I'm going to go. I missed one. So. Uh, would it be the most possible inter the intervention point to be counseling during effective uh, postpartum family planning? Would it be during ANC or during delivery? I think I'm, I'm going to just make a start on this, just to note that I think multiple points is is probably the idea of, of, of providing some, and certain types of counseling does need to happen before delivery because sometimes in delivery itself is a fairly um, it's an intense process and so you know getting full informed consent during delivery and especially if there are complications it may be more tricky so I think a lot of the idea of having some counseling especially for immediate postpartum family planning before delivery so that there can be some planning going on is, is generally considered a best practice um, but it's it's looking at having multiple contact points but again I will open up and just ask my colleagues in Bangladesh for a little bit more, any any further comments on the with the most effective time for looking at uh, postpartum family planning update? We do have a couple of studies going on right now, specifically looking at a and uh, counselling in ANC on um, postpartum family planning um, that we are, that are ongoing at the moment, and we'll have results from later this year. But um, Moin, or do you want to add anything on this, or Mizan? Uh, no, I have nothing to add in here. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there's a couple more questions. I'm conscious of time. Um, uh, how to measure provider bias quantitatively? Um, there are a number of studies that go ongoing. Well, number of studies that have tried to look at this. I was just at the Moyne and I were recently at the International Conference on Family Planning, and there are some studies that were being presented there that looked at provider bias. Um, some of the ways to do that are with using things like um, mystery clients who go and see what providers actually say. There are uh, clinical vignettes that can look for certain types of provider bias by having providers walk through different scenarios and see how they counsel and that can pick up some um, evidence on provider bias. Um, you can also look at provider knowledge and questions and attitudes and practices with sort of Likert scale types of questions. Um, some, all of these have strengths and limitations in terms of the types of biases that you get, you know, providers what providers say they would do versus what they actually do can be quite different. But there are a number of different types of study, particularly using mystery to clients, clinical vignettes, um, and sort of attitude scales that are that are that are that's active area of work right now. Um, does anyone want to add anything to that? No, go ahead with the next one. All right, let's go on. Uh, I think this might be a good question for you, Mizan. Um, so the Bangladesh's TFR is 2.3. Is there any concern from managers as to why Bangladesh still needs to invest in family planning? Are they concerned about population in the longer run or population decline? 
um, this is a concern in Nepal. Um, would you like to respond to that one? Misa? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> this is a kind of uh, speculating and political. Anyway, it currently, though it is 2.3, uh, still unmet need for female pending is 12%, meaning that there are unwanted pregnancies. And I think uh, unwanted pregnancy is about one in three, 30% 30, 30 women say, I didn't want that uh, the birth that time. Oh, so we, the, our approach should be to meet the demand for women that they, they don't, they, they have unmet need for family planning and they had unwanted pregnancy and which has consequences for their life, for their health, for the health of the children, and so on and so forth. So I think this is not yet the time to think about aging of the people in the future, but I think we have to first fulfill the need of the women who, uh, in providing female planning and reproductive health services. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Misan. Um, I'm going to take one more here, and then we will... Um, I, I know you've got to be conscious of time, but then, so Kola has asked, um, do you consider any factors relating to women's autonomy on fertility decline or use of family planning? Um, in the full paper on the fertility decline data that I presented early on, we did look at um, women's labor force participation and education to try and capture a little bit of that role of gender in fertility decline and um, and fertility preferences. We did, um, particularly within the context of framework that John Bongotz developed in 2002 or three, that looks at issues that in very low fertility population, what drives um, exceeding or, or not meeting fertility preferences and looked at a number of gender and sort of competition with childbearing types of factors. So we didn't have great data on that to look at it directly, but we did look at education and um, women's labor force participation and found that, that, that the women's labor force participation, for example, did not affect fertility preferences, but it did affect whether or not they had a birth in the three years before the survey. So um, we, we've done, looked at that a little bit, but I think there's more that could be done on that. Um, um, Mizan, would you? Like no, I think, yeah, you, you covered it. Okay. Now, Gabby, I'm conscious we are now at nine o'clock. We have a few more questions. Um, so do you want to say some closing remarks and then we can stay on? If anybody wants to stay on, we can ask, take the rest of the questions, but I'm conscious of people respecting people's time. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Moins. Thank you, Mizan. Thank you, Nafi, for the excellent presentation. And thank you all the participants for these um, really uh, great questions. I see only a couple more questions. So if you can hang on, maybe Sean and team, you can respond to them. But otherwise, I thank everyone for participating today. Just a reminder that once the webinar is over, all of you that are on this call or that registered will receive a link to the webinar recording, and you will also receive um, all of these slides. And all the sources are, um, as you saw at the end of the presentation. So with that, thank you so much. For those, um, Sean and team, if you can stay on and answer the last couple of questions, that would be great. Okay, great. thanks very much. Okay, so I think um, this is um, the, um, the question now is, is there any data on effects of husband's counseling on use of family planning methods? Um, I'm not sure, Misan or Moin, are you aware <laughs> of studies have looked at this? No, I don't think we, we, uh, we, we didn't do this kind of, but there are literature say, suggests that the, if counseling is given to, to both of the uh, spouses, it's more effective, more, more uh, higher, greater use of contraception. So uh, literature, <laughs> but I, I, we didn't do any, any of these studies. Oh, thank you. And I think the only other question, I think uh, Maida, you were at, when I was asking for the stair, the studies, uh, maybe you could pop in the chat which ones you wanted. Uh, was it the, the studies on the measuring provider bias? Um, I'm not quite sure. Which, which yeah, I think that was it, Sean. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I can think, I, I, I'll see if I can find any that we can share as well. Okay.
All right. And I think that's actually it then. Yeah. Okay. Studies on provider bias. Yeah. We're doing some work on vignettes, but we haven't published it yet. But I will I'll look and see what else we can find. Thank you. Okay. I think that's it then. I think we managed to get through them all. Great discussion. Thanks, everyone. All right. I think we can wrap up then, Gabby. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for hanging on. And thank you to the presenters and team. And please be on the lookout for the link to the webinar recording and the slides. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day, evening. That's it. Okay. Thank you.